Smart speakers help with a lot these days. Did you know you can use your smart speaker to hear the top stories of the day from a Catholic perspective? On Google Home, all you have to do is walk up to your speaker and say, Hey Google, play Catholic news. Here's the latest news. Welcome to your Catholic Daily News Briefing. If you have an Alexa, it's pretty much the same. Just say, Alexa, open Catholic News. Welcome back to the latest news from Catholic News Agency. Go to catholicnewsagency.com slash smart speakers for more information. Having a decent place to live is a foundational part of being human. It's essential for a stable family life, a stable community, and a stable society. People deserve a decent place to live because of the inherent dignity of being made in the image of God. We're talking about this now because the United States could be headed for a housing cliff, and millions of people, pushed into unemployment or crushed under medical bills by the pandemic, could be about to fall over the edge. A national moratorium on evictions will be ending this month, and unless too much changes, a lot of people are about to become homeless. This week on CNA Newsroom, we're going to get some perspective on the complicated factors that go into keeping people in a decent home. One of the reasons a person might lose their home is because they can't afford a lawyer. We'll speak with a Catholic priest about the importance of legal representation for poor renters. Then, we'll hear from a Catholic Charities organization in Missouri that's working to keep people in their homes. And finally, we'll hear what happened when a Catholic landlord decided not to collect rent for a whole month from his 200 tenants. Stay with us. You may have heard on the news that a nationwide eviction moratorium put in place by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention will soon be ending. But what did the moratorium actually do in the first place? Well, the eviction moratorium was an emergency effort put in place by the CDC a year ago and intended to allow renters to stay in their homes, even if they can't afford to pay rent. Meanwhile, Congress has so far allocated about $46 billion for emergency rental assistance amid the pandemic, but it's been slow to roll out. The CDC ordered the moratorium last July, and it's been extended several times since then, most recently until July 31st. And although the Supreme Court ruled last month that the moratorium could remain in place until that date, the administration says it has no plans to extend it any further. A moratorium is just a band-aid. It's a temporary band-aid to keep things getting really bad really quickly and to give you time to deal with the situation better. With the, the sort of the crisis of COVID kind of coming to an end, I think it's time for states, local state and federal jurisdictions to start thinking past the moratoria, right? Uh, that's my hope. Father Pius Petrick is a Dominican priest who sits on the board of the Legal Services Corporation, a group which, among other things, helps people facing eviction get legal representation in court. Landlords are almost always represented by counsel, and tenants are almost never uh, represented by counsel. And not surprisingly, you get, in almost every case, uh, decisions largely in favor of the landlord. We've had Father Pius on the show before, earlier this year. At the time, he warned that the end of the federal eviction moratorium would pose a major challenge to those struggling to pay rent and to those helping them. As far as we can tell, he's been correct. The national moratorium is set to expire at the end of July, even though some states have their own moratoria that will continue past that date. But when the national moratorium does end, many people could find themselves kicked out of their homes. An organization like the LSC can help in these situations by helping negotiate a better situation for the renter, especially if the renter has a legitimate reason for not being able to pay. People get, get the impression that, you know, all we have in the world in the U.S. are these ter terrible, evil, cruel landlords who are just eager to throw people out. Look, landlords don't make money by throwing people out for no good reason. <laughs> landlords make money by having people rent their properties. 
you know, most of the time the landlords have a good legal cause, usually non-payment of rent, uh, to, to force the, the, the eviction. The, what you need a good lawyer for is to help you sort of negotiate the transition. So you, so the desire to have, a, a, you know, somebody who's savvy enough to uh, negotiate either a, a payment plan uh, so that they can get the landlord the money, but maybe extend that out a little bit, or they can give, ask the landlord to give them a little bit more time and negotiate some time so that the tenant has a chance to find another place um, and to move out his things, um, you know, on his own terms a little bit so they're not just dumped onto the lawn by the sheriff. Somebody who can help the tenant transition into different housing because what you really don't want is no plan, right? All of a sudden, this person is just evicted. There's no chance for them for an ordered removal of their things and certainly no plan for an ordered removal into some other form of housing. Despite a lot of attention paid to the National Moratorium, there's certainly been some places where the moratorium hasn't been all that effective. If you were to ask one of our attorneys doing this work in our local eviction courts, they would probably say, what moratorium? That's Laura Tuggle, executive director of Southeast Louisiana Legal Services. She said they've seen an almost 300 percent increase in the amount of requests for help with eviction cases as compared to 2019. While the moratorium has been extremely helpful with stopping or slowing evictions based upon non-payment, it doesn't cover the whole waterfront of how a family could wind up being evicted. So if you can't evict a tenant for non-payment of rent and maybe the lease hasn't expired, a landlord could allege that a tenant is making too much noise in a property, or maybe they're damaging the property, or maybe they're doing something else that the landlord says um, is, is a violation of a lease. And we have definitely seen an increase in those as well. Laura said local industry in Louisiana, which is highly reliant on services, hospitality, and tourism, took a huge hit when the pandemic struck. And then, more recently, Louisiana had several rounds of hurricanes and flooding. So we had a 2,533% increase in the amount of people seeking our help for unemployment cases. And that unemployment affected people's ability to pay rent. If we can help resolve that unemployment issue then that family may get their benefits so that they can then pay their rent so that the landlord then has the income he needs to to do what it is that he needs to do to stabilize his life. And so sometimes it's just working out an arrangement where they won't have an eviction judgment on their record because that can do long-term permanent damage to people's credit and, and ability to rent housing, get loans, all those kind of things later. So we, we do a lot of different legal work and advocacy work to try to help people stay housed. We know fairly well that when people lose a home, they slide much more quickly uh, down the poverty, uh, down the level of poverty. Um, and we've sort of put that off now for about a year and a half. Problem is, is what you're going to do is all of a sudden have this massive rush of homeless people, or, you know, people without a place to stay. Although some of them will find some accommodation, um, and it'll be happening in sort of short order, sort of putting just massive increase of pressure on social services agencies uh, and and thrusting a lot more people into poverty. And it's really a public health issue. Uh, you know, there's a lot of studies out there that show that if, if evictions were allowed to continue at the original pace that they were going before the CDC moratorium came in place, that we would have exponential amounts of, of deaths related to COVID and community spread directly stemming back to evictions. Of course, these kinds of services take money to operate. And Father Pius is quick to point out that the Legal Services Corporation is massively underfunded and has been for years. The LSE doesn't have the resources to deal with what's coming. You know, we Congress asked us to do some some time ago an evaluation of what we think the resources we would need to assist the tenants uh, who are facing eviction right now. And we and we looked it up, and we t- I think we told them it was like two and a half billion dollars, something like that. Now our current our current budget for the all of LSE, all everything that our grantees do is something like four hundred and fifty million. 
We need, you know, another two and a half billion, you know, five times what you already fund us. I mean, I think that in and of itself just conveys the, the size of the problem. That lack of funding is keenly felt in local legal aid agencies. Alabama is one of only two states in the country that has never appropriated money for legal aid. The other is Idaho. Guy Lascaux is executive director of Legal Services Alabama, one of the LSC's grantees. In terms of the statistics for Alabama, where poverty, we rank 49. Racial disparity, we rank 49. And it just gets worse as you go down the list, as you can imagine. I think we're a poor state in the allocation of where we want to put our money. Typically, some 80% of their funding comes from the LSC, and last year they got some much-needed additional funding from the CARES Act. Legal Services Alabama operates a call center where people can call to get connected to free legal services. They've seen a massive increase in demand since the pandemic started. A lot of uh, the calls are uh, basic uh, looking for information. I think I always use the best example is uh, how can I get food stamps? Where do I go for food stamps? You don't need a lawyer. For more serious situations, such as a poor person facing eviction or domestic violence, a call to the statewide call center often will be directed to one of their lawyers. Lesko says they deal with many elderly people and children in their work. And the population served by Legal Services Alabama is about 70% female and nearly two-thirds black. Well, specifically under the COVID pandemic, uh, not only everybody's sort of focused right now on the eviction, but uh, we've seen a huge increase in uh, domestic violence. It sort of goes hand in hand when you have uh, lockdown orders, loss of employment, all of the other things. I mean, if you look at it, it's... These issues are not isolated. They're all uh, intertwined. Lesko says he hopes more people will learn about their work and subsequently support it. People need to know that uh, legal aid is nonpartisan. The old Supreme Court has a marker that says equal justice under the law for all. But there are a whole lots of people who can't afford a lawyer. And there, there comes the rub as to, okay, if there's equal justice under the law, what about me? Laura and Lesko both said their organizations will happily receive community members who want to volunteer, as well as monetary donations. It always amazes me that we've been around for over 50 years, and there are so many people in the community that either don't know what legal aid is or have no idea how to, how to get to folks. Father Pius says the Catholic view of a right to housing doesn't entail an absolute right. Landlords have their rights too, of course. But he says a Catholic view does demand that no one be unjustly removed from their home. One cannot be unjustly removed from from one's home. And and I I do think that means that your removal from a a home requires a, a due process. Our access to due process is access to somebody who provides legal assistance, right? It's the courts, and your access to the courts is is a lawyer. And there is a real problem, I think, in this country with regards to something as a fundamental right as the home uh, and one's right to a home, and where one often, because of poverty, has no access to the legal resources they need to help them understand how they are to remain in their home. We can't be content to look at this simply as a violation of a contract that calls for the tenant to be evicted. If we believe seriously in the right to to housing, uh, we should as a society be interested not only in, in that kind of justice for the landlord, but in providing some means for the tenant to, to, to reclaim some housing somewhere. As we mentioned, there are a ton of complicated factors that go into housing. Our executive producer, Kate Oliveira, spoke with another agency working to keep the poor housed. Here's Kate. Catholic Charities of Southern Missouri serves the state's 39 southernmost counties, many of which are among the most impoverished counties in the entire nation. The agency is no stranger to homelessness. 
or families at risk of homelessness. But the coronavirus pandemic changed the ball game. In a matter of weeks, starting last spring, families who were previously not at risk of homelessness were suddenly in need of assistance. And many of the people we're talking about, some were struggling before to pay their rent, but many of them have never needed services before. Mara Taylor is executive director of Catholic Charities of Southern Missouri. Whether it be a reduction in hours or people who are furloughed or moms, whose children were not in school or couldn't find daycare and now had to stay home. The loss of that income in households all across America that live paycheck to paycheck results in them having arrears, arrears in their rent, arrears in their utilities, and puts them at risk of eviction. Catholic Charities is among the local community partners that have been entrusted with helping Missouri renters apply for federal pandemic relief. The state of Missouri has received some $593 million for rental and utilities assistance. Their program's called the SAFER program. And in that program, they can get up to a year's worth of a rental or a rental or utility arrears if they qualify. And our agency, as well as some other agencies, have been designated to assist in the application process and to help people in need who um, are going to be facing eviction to get that financial assistance that can help them remain stably housed. And the coronavirus pandemic is far from over in southern Missouri. The area has been hit particularly hard in the last few weeks by the Delta variant. This is really a, an opportunity for people to start fresh. Again, people who never had arrears, never had these struggles. Housing has been a part of the agency's outreach since 2011, when flash flooding and a historic tornado devastated the region. What we found was that the people we were serving at that time in those disasters most of them had been struggling before the disaster. Most of them were struggling with housing issues, either uh, the ability to cover their rent and utilities, or it could be even just that they had previous experiences that resulted in evictions and now have barriers to housing. The agency adopted a three-pronged approach to the housing crisis in their area, including rapid rehousing for the homeless. Those that are homeless families, we work with them. They're referred to us and we try to get them into permanent housing. Homelessness prevention. Those are households that are facing evictions. So we work with them to cover their rent utilities and then walk alongside them to address those uh, barriers that um, are putting them at risk or those that were homeless, addressing those barriers that resulted in their becoming homeless. And transitional housing, especially for homeless pregnant women and their children. Last year, Catholic Charities began offering temporary shelter for families specifically impacted by COVID. The shelter includes on-site case managers who work with families to help them obtain permanent housing and employment and help them move towards self-sufficiency so they can cover their rent utilities once they're permanently housed. Mara said stable housing is the first step for individuals and families to find success in other areas of life. Someone who's, who's homeless is struggling day to day just to find shelter, to find food, to find all the basics that it's difficult for them to address the issues or the challenges that have led to their homelessness. It's difficult for someone to get, get a job if they're living in their car or on the streets. But if you can get them stably housed, whether it be in a shelter or permanent housing, then you can work with them on connecting with long-term employment. You can work with them on accessing mental health services if they have a need in that area or address the other challenges that may be facing them that puts them at risk for homelessness. Mara said her agency's immediate focus is getting the word out about the federal funding available to help as many families as possible stay in their homes. Because having an eviction history makes it so much more difficult to find permanent housing. Because all across the country, we don't have enough low-income affordable rentals. 
And even if we have money to house people, we don't have enough rentals to house them. And therefore, it makes it more and more difficult if someone has a barrier, such as an eviction history. So if we can help them now, if, if people will come in to the agencies that have this funding available, these counties and the state that has the money available, and get the assistance to prevent an eviction history, it will help those families in the long run to get stabilized, and to have greater opportunities in the future. For CNA Newsroom, I'm Kate Oliveira. After the break, we'll head to New York and meet a Catholic landlord with an unorthodox approach to the eviction crisis. Stay tuned. My name is Luke Coppin. I'm the Europe Editor for Catholic News Agency, based in England. Catholic News Agency has bureaus across the globe, one on nearly every continent. From my base here in the UK, I oversee our coverage of the Vatican and the Pope. When I'm not editing stories, I enjoy listening to CNA Newsroom, because with its bold and imaginative storytelling, it takes me beyond the headlines and into the lives of extraordinary Catholics in the United States and elsewhere around the world. If you like what you hear on CNA Newsroom, please subscribe to the program on your favourite podcast app. It's available for free on all podcast platforms, including Apple Podcasts, Spotify and many others. To subscribe, simply open your phone's podcast app, search for CNA Newsroom and tap subscribe. And please, when you subscribe, leave us a rating and a review. And now, sit back and relax, pour a cup of tea and enjoy the rest of the program. Many people lost their jobs at the start of the coronavirus pandemic, and some have yet to find work. As the pandemic took hold, one landlord took matters into his own hands. EWTN News reporter Colm Flynn has the story. Now, hang on a second. Don't worry, I won't keep you long, Mario. What are we doing? Come on. I'm in a small back office in Brooklyn, New York. Oh, we're in the back of my office here, where we keep all the private work here, paperwork, Now, normally in an office like this, it would be stacked with papers and files and perhaps a couple of family photos. But this one looks a little different. All around us, there are religious statues, religious pictures on the wall, holy cards on the desk. It's almost like a small shrine. A lot of statues. This is a very sacred place in my life. The office and that voice belong to Mr. Mario Salerno. And if you couldn't tell by his accent, Mario's a true New Yorker in every sense of the word. He's buff, he talks fast, he's tan, and he's got an infectious energy about him. Can't wait to leave my house and come into Brooklyn and get into the hustle and bustle. Seeing my tenants, I run a mechanic shop, seeing all my good customers, and to see wonderful people like you, that I can't put words on. Oh, come you on, you're, 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 you're like a, you're a charmer. Mario is a landlord, overseeing more than 200 tenants living in 80 apartments throughout Brooklyn. He's also a businessman. He owns a mechanic shop, a petrol station, and an auto body shop. My dad started in 59. When I finished school, 1977, I came aboard. I expanded a little at a time. We did a little more and more. And, you know, we brought in, I brought in my children. My son has a nice body shop. My youngest son runs all the electrical computers. And me, I tried to... If you couldn't tell by the religious paraphernalia adorning Mario's office, Mario is a man of strong Catholic faith, in addition to being a successful and savvy businessman. As a landlord to so many tenants, Mario saw firsthand the difficulties posed by the coronavirus pandemic lockdowns last year. He says many of his tenants lost their jobs. Some couldn't afford to pay their rent. And so, at the end of March 2020, Mario made a decision. I gave everyone free rent for the month of April. Mario posted notices on all his buildings that April's rent 
would be waived. And I actually interviewed him at the time that this happened. I told them not to worry, not to panic. We're going through some very tough times with this monster disease. I wanted them to have some peace in mind, not to worry about where their next dollar was. As a human, I felt a lot more comfortable making sure that they had food on their table, which several of them didn't. And I felt very honored to tell them that. The coronavirus pandemic hit New York relatively early and hard. Unemployment jumped to record levels as the city locked down. And across the country, the unemployment rate skyrocketed from around 4% to 15% as the pandemic took hold. Mario said many of his tenants were hurting and that they couldn't pay the rent. My tenants were all worried at the time of the pandemic. And I told them, just like I told you, keep the money. Take care of your family, wash your hands, give a helping hand to someone else because it meant so much to me. After Mario posted these notices, many of his tenants approached him offering to help to pump gas at the station, mop the buildings and offer other help and gratitude for what he had done. But Mario wouldn't hear of it. If I could make it easier on someone's life not worrying that they have to go to work and just be considered and compassionate towards their roommates, towards their neighbors, just pass it on. Obviously a landlord failing to collect rent for an entire month, especially from several hundred tenants, represents a pretty significant financial loss. I asked Mario many times how much money he lost by doing this, but each time he stayed quiet, he's been pretty coy about it. And I'll say it again, it's irrelevant to the human life because God guaranteed blessed me, made me healthy, made me so much more focused on how people needed assistance at the time. Mario's act of generosity did not go unnoticed. In fact, for a little while, Mario became a bit of a celebrity. He's a landlord from Brooklyn who told his 200 tenants not to pay rent in April. Hi, Mario. How are you? I'm fantastic. How are you? I'm fine. Thank you for having me. I'm on it. And you really look terrific there. Do people I, want to make a reality show afterwards? Yeah, a couple people called and they wanted to film a reality show. You can't let the reality TV cameras in. It all culminated in an invitation of a lifetime for Mario, a call from President Donald J. Trump and a trip to the White House for the National Day of Prayer. I, uh, I was honored. I was invited to the White House, National Day of Prayer. I prayed not only for our country and not only for the rest of the world because of the pandemic. I also uh, met the president and I also said a prayer for him because at the time he, uh, he was our leader. On this special day of prayer, I have nothing written. I just want to thank the good Lord. Every morning when I wake up, 3.30 in the morning, get ready, put my feet, I pray. And I ask the good Lord, please conquer this vicious virus. Faith before fear. And Mr. President, I'm honored to be here and I pray for you every day. God bless America and God bless you, Mr. President. Thank you. Mario's a family man, and he says the strong Catholic faith he has today was passed on to him by his late mother and father. My dad passed away 2017. My dad lived a wonderful wife, a life, uh, had a wonderful family and a wonderful wife. My dad passed away 2017. He lived to 88 years old, which was wonderful. When I lost my mom over 21 years ago, and my mom was a 60-year-old young lady, did nothing but prayed the rosary and prayed. And it really, in the beginning, I asked the good Lord, why my mom, such a religious woman, had to suffer of a nasty cancerous disease, and why did you take her away? And a good friend of mine one day told me, Mario, the good Lord needed your mother to take care of a garden in heaven. I didn't accept it in the beginning, but as time went by, I said, hey, it wasn't fair that the good Lord needed my mom. And every day I pray to her and I tell her, 
please guide me. And uh, it's very emotional. My mom was a very religious person and it became a very big part of my life. And I became even more increasing faith. And whenever I would have lose my faith, I would tell mom, increase my faith. Tell the good Lord to protect me. Tell the Holy Spirit, please give me the strength. And that's why we stand here today. Because a lot of people that would turn them off faith, something yes. like that, losing their mother to yes. cancer. It's only 60 years of age. Very young. My mom passed away. She really didn't even get to enjoy my children, you know, as a grandma. But she's looking down over them now and she's guiding them in, in the right direction. So what's next for Mario Salerno? I like being a quiet person now. That's I don't believe it. that for a second. Huh? <laughs> Celebrity, too much. Everyone wants to use Mario for a billboard. Who wants to make some reality shows? But oh, no, no. Although Mario's had his time in the spotlight and he wants to go back to some sort of peaceful anonymity, he does say that there is one other thing he hopes his newfound fame might help him to achieve. Maybe with your contact, you could tell our dear Pope, Mario's a nice religious man. He would like to come visit you, sir. I just want to meet the Pope. <laughs> For CNA Newsroom, I'm Colm Flynn. CNA Newsroom is a production of Catholic News Agency, a service of EWTN News. I'm your host, Jonah McKeown, and our executive producer is Kate Oliveira. A special thanks this week to Father Pius Petrick, Laura Tuggle, Guy Lesko, Maura Taylor, Colm Flynn, and Mario Salerno. We'll be back next week. See you then.